Last episode, we started to look at the upper torso and its relationship with the head and neck. We saw that indeed the standard ideas around posture encourage you to pull your head back to fight this concept of forward head posture. But we also looked at F.M. Alexander, and we saw that he demonstrated a totally different posture, one where the head seems to be forward of the torso. How do we make sense of these different ideas? First, let's examine what forward head posture means. The exact idea varies, but the basics are very clear. If the back of the head is forward of the back, which will coincide with the ear being forward of the shoulder, then you are considered to have forward head posture. It is proposed that the cervical spine, which is the neck, should curve backwards so that your head is well behind the front of your body. So does that mean F.M. Alexander had forward head posture? That depends on what you mean by forward head posture. If you simply mean did he have his head forward of his body, then yes. But let's zoom out from the head and examine the torso as well. If we look at the common pictures of forward head posture, we see a torso shaped like this. The upper end is bent back, the pelvis is tipped forward, the back is, as we say, shortened. You may recall this shape, it's actually very similar to the shape of what is proposed to be good posture. If we had to put words to the differences between these two postures, we would have to say that the so-called good one shows a more significant bend back of the ribcage, and an abdomen that is further forward out over the feet. But both are certainly pressing their mid-torso forward. This bent back is what you will always see in someone who is said to have forward head posture. So if you consider forward head posture to be part of a broader postural syndrome throughout the body, then we cannot say Alexander had forward head posture, because his back looks nothing like this. His head is forward, but in a different way than what is typically called forward head posture. So now we must ask, is it possible to have your head pulled back, as is advised by the common postural advice, without moving your lower ribs forward, that is, without rotating the rib cage so that the top goes back and the bottom goes forward? While it may be possible to do briefly, what you will find is that in every picture of so-called good posture, the person is pushing forward their lower ribs, protruding their abdomen, and rotating the top of their ribcage back. The idea that the ear should be lined up over the shoulder, which is a very common piece of advice that is given, is especially heinous from my perspective. As you've seen if you watched the series I put out on the arms, most people are retracting their shoulders and arms quite severely. If you try to line your head up over your shoulder in those conditions, you will be massively retracting your head. Something has to compensate for all that weight going back. If you pull your head and your shoulders back, your mid and lower torso will go forward. There is no other possibility. We of course already know why this is a major problem. Your thoracolumbar fascia goes up and down your spine at the back. Fascia needs to be taught to function properly. If you pull your head back, and push your midsection forward, you are making your thoracolumbar fascia slack. Jean de Massoero has made this simplified model of the problem. The spring at the back represents the spring that we have at our back, which is the thoracolumbar fascia. While we may think of springs as working by us pressing them down and allowing them to spring back into shape, springs also work the other way. If you pull on the ends of a spring, the spring wants to pull back to a shorter configuration. It has elastic resistance. However, if you maintain the spring in its lengthened configuration, it will become quite sturdy. It can be relied upon for support. What this model shows is that if your head is pulled back, you are releasing the spring at your back, which means it will provide you with very little support. Whereas if your head is forward and up, you will pull on the top end of the spring. This is one reason that we want our head forward of our torso and not directly over it. We are not balancing our head on top of our body. That is a misconception of how our body works. Our body is not a stack of objects that balance on top of each other. We are a moving creature. Our head is held up by the spring that is at our back. Just like a tensegrity model, we are able to suspend our head in a seemingly out-of-balance position by having our fascia lengthened and taut. 
but of course most people don't have the support of the spring at their back. Their fascia is not taut, it's slack, and so their head doesn't have support. There are only bad options for you in those circumstances. You either pull your head back and try to balance it over your body, or you let your head fall and drag you down. Neither of these is a good option, but when you don't understand the effect your back has on your head, you have no other options. However, it's worth noting that many images you'll find of forward head posture are fake. They are someone doing an impersonation of forward head posture. Most actual pictures of forward head posture show someone who still does not have their head as far forward as I would recommend. This man, for instance, is retracting his head in both pictures. This problem that you can't sustain your head where it should be until you've lengthened and widened your back is part of why the torso is primary and must be addressed before the head and neck. If your torso is in bad shape, it won't be able to support your head. So how do we correct our torso? I've gone into more detail on this in the series about the torso, as well as in the series about the arms and legs, but briefly the idea is that we want to rotate the ribcage around the lower sternum. Above the lower sternum you go forward and up. Below the lower sternum you go back and up. The ultimate goal is to make the sternum vertically straight. The back of the ribcage, as we've seen, will not be straight exactly. It will be vertically straight up to the armpit, then it will round forward as the ribs get smaller in diameter. The pelvis, which is the lower end of the torso, is also crucial. What's happening in your pelvis also has a major effect on your head. The pelvis needs to be moved backwards in space so it no longer spills forward with the mid-torso. We want to rotate the pelvis by pulling the iliacs back and up, and making sure to untilt the back of the pelvis by moving the top end back while not allowing the lower end to go back as quickly. These simultaneous movements will pull the back in two directions, lengthening it. That will stretch the spring at our back, which is the thoracolumbar fascia, from both ends, and then we will be in a position to manipulate our neck and head. Let's again think about this common idea of pulling the head back. Doing that is going to have an effect on the neck. It's in fact going to curve the cervical spine somewhat backwards at the top. This is believed by many to be correct and desirable, but I want you to think about something. What is pulling your head back like this and curving your neck back going to do to your airway? Because you have an airway that you breathe through that connects your nose and mouth to your lungs. That airway is essentially a tube, and it connects to the hilum of the lung, which is closer to the back than the front of the body. What is going to happen to the tube when you pull your head back? Give it some thought and then join me next episode, and we'll begin to look at how the head, neck, and torso affect breathing.